Well, good morning to all of you. I want to welcome you. My name is Paul Muma. I'm the lead pastor here. And whether you are joining us halfway around the world or maybe just a few minutes uh, down the street from where we are right now, we are glad that you joined us for worship today here at Genesis Church. And I want to say happy Mother's Day uh, to all of the moms that are out there. And I think my mom is watching from Central Illinois as well. And so happy Mother's Day to you, Mom. I thought you might like to see a picture uh, of me and my mom. Um, I I am so grateful for her. Uh, She is one of the kindest, uh, most thoughtful people that I know, and I am so grateful for her love and support. Uh, She's a great grandma, uh, well, not a great grandma, but she's a wonderful grandma uh, as well, and so uh, I'm so thankful for that too, and uh, I I hope that you have some great memories uh, of mom, or maybe, uh, you know, mom's sitting next to you right now. Um, uh, Maybe you've got a, a special uh, person in your life, uh, a woman who, who played that mom role for you. Here, here's what we'd like to encourage today. Uh, would you post a picture uh, maybe of you and your mom or you and, and that special uh, person? Uh, post it on social media somewhere. Make sure to hashtag it Genesis Moms and, and maybe tell a story, share a, a thought of, of what mom means to you. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's celebrate uh, those women uh, in our lives today and thank you for the role. Thank them uh, for the role that they play. How many of you uh, would say that you are the one responsible uh, for purchasing groceries regularly in your household? And and I know that I can't see your hands if they're going up in the air right now, so maybe give me a, a smiley face emoji or something similar. And I realize that, you know, today things have changed and you can order your groceries online. I grew up in the 1900s uh, when you had to go to the grocery store to actually get your groceries. And so, again, maybe Maybe just kind of let us know if you're the primary grocery shopper for your house, all right? Now, now with that in mind, though, I, w- I want to ask, give me a thumbs up uh, if you are not the person responsible for buying groceries regularly, but once in a while, you might get sent to the store to pick up a few items, all right? That's me, all right? That's the role that I play. And even this past week, uh, my wife Jenny, she called me and she said, hey, on your way home, would you stop by the store and pick up a bag of lettuce? Can I just ask you a question today? When, When did picking out lettuce get so complicated? Right? I mean, I, I remember that you know, picking out lettuce was just one head of lettuce, but, but now to, to go and, and all of the different varieties of, of choosing even something as simple as a bag of lettuce. Have you been to the yogurt section of the grocery store recently? Uh, and whether it's Greek yogurt or rice yogurt or low-fat yogurt or no-fat yogurt, you want fruit on the bottom, fruit on the top, or fruit mixed in, I don't even know anymore. All right? I, don't, I, don't know, I don't even know what kind of yogurt uh, that I need. And then don't get started on the, the uh, cereal aisle either. I mean, take Cheerios for an example. Did you know that at any given time there are something like 16 different uh, kinds of, of Cheerios? I mean, it really is amazing when you think about it. And when you go to the grocery store, how many different choices are before you, all of the selections and opportunities to choose from. And I found this interesting, at least according to one report. Did you know that in 1990, the average grocery store had somewhere uh, between 7,000 to 9,000 different items to choose from? Today, get this, today the average grocery store has something like 43,000 items to choose from, unless of course you're looking for toilet paper or baking flour and whatever on the toilet paper, but I want to know who's baking all the bread, right? And and where is all of these baked goods that that are being baked today? I mean, again, it's 2020, but the point is this, the point is this, that every day we are bombarded with a vast number of choices, a, a plethora of decisions, and it's not just grocery store items either. It also applies to different worldviews, uh, ideologies, and religious beliefs. 
And if you're new with us today, over the last few weeks, we've been participating in a series that many churches around the country have participated in over the last couple of years. It's a teaching series called Explore God. And what we're doing is we're diving into seven big questions that most everyone has about issues like faith and and spirituality in God. And our hope for this series uh, isn't just to try and convince you of something, but to invite you. Uh, whoever you are and wherever you might be participating from, uh, to explore these seven different questions of God with us. And today, as you heard a moment ago, today uh, we want to look at a question, uh, a question that uh, many people in our modern world today ask or have asked at least at one time or another, but it's the question, is Christianity too narrow? Is Christianity too narrow? Now, I don't think having uh, lots of choices at a grocery store today is a bad thing. I I don't think that's a bad thing at all. But, But what do we do? What are we supposed to do with all of the different choices that we have when it comes to matters of spirituality, uh, when it comes to matters of religion? Like... My, 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 my guess is that many of you have seen uh, this bumper sticker uh, before. You've, you've seen it on the car in front of you in traffic. It's the, uh, the bumper sticker, the message of, of coexist. And uh, you probably have some idea of what this represents, but if you kind of walk through it one symbol uh, after another, the uh, sea or the, the crescent moon and the star represents Islam. Uh, the, the peace symbol or the, the karma wheel uh, represents Buddhism today. Uh, the E is supposed to stand for things like energy and, and science. The, the star of David uh, would certainly be Judaism. Uh, the I or the dot of the I or the pentagram uh, represents Wicca or the pagan religions. The uh, yin-yang, Hinduism, and then finally the cross uh, representing Christianity. And, and I'll say this, the overall message of the Coexist campaign, uh, it can be interpreted a number of different ways. And when it stands for things like religious freedom, uh, when it stands for respecting one another in spite of our differences, I'm certainly supportive of that. I, I think that every Christian should be supportive of a message like that. But let's be honest. I mean, even when you think about a campaign or a message like this, the, the underlying meaning of a symbol like this one is the idea that it doesn't matter what you believe. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, uh, what you think, that all religions are the same. And, and again, it doesn't matter what you do, just pick one that works for you. But let me ask this, like what if there are real differences among these religions that have eternal consequences for every single one of us? Like, is choosing a religion much like choosing a box of Cheerios at the grocery store? Like, is it really intended to be that simple? Or is something greater at stake? See, the fact is that there are some significant differences between the world, the major world religions today that that you and I can't afford to ignore. For example, let's just take a moment... And, and take a brief look at, at what various religions have to teach about how to find your way back to God or at least the path uh, to eternal life. Well, let's start with Orthodox Judaism. Um, uh, according to Orthodox Judaism, again, a major foundation of, of their faith is that a person has to obey 613 different commands to please God. I mean, obedience to the law with Judaism is a critical path to heaven. Uh, similar with the faith of of Islam. A a person, according to Islam, a person can achieve eternal life uh, by adhering to the strict five pillars of Islam and and living a just and and nearly a a perfect sort of a life. Uh, Buddhism emphasizes the ultimate goal of achieving nirvana, and one gets there uh, by working towards an elimination of all physical desire. And then finally, with Hinduism, uh, Hinduism says that one works their way to heaven by becoming one with Brahma, the all-prevailing force of the universe. And that's achieved, again, by living this this perfect moral life. And and then a a person lives life over and over again until they finally perfect it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there aren't good people 
uh, a part of any of these religions or that there aren't even positive characteristics, certainly, about these religions. But there are two major observations that you can make about any one of these. The, the first, I would say, is this, that, that each religion, at least from what I have just briefly shared, each religion presents an exclusive, unique path. Like each has their own belief system uh, about eternal life and how to achieve it. And so that means that every religion is narrow, so to speak. But also, secondly, I want you to see how each religion, these major world religions, stress the importance of personal performance. That basically it's about how hard you work, how good you are, and whether you can do enough in this life. It puts everything on you and what you can accomplish. And that, in itself, is what makes each of these religions so different than what we call Christianity. And let me just say this, that when it comes to Christianity, I know that there are a lot of different perspectives on what Christianity is and what it teaches. And if you're like me, and when you see others on TV or on social media talking on behalf of Christians, there are times where I certainly can't help but cringe a little bit. Today, I want to make sure you know what we believe as a church, what's important to us when it comes to Jesus and, and what it comes to Christianity and, and what, what these messages, what the message of Christianity, the heart of Christianity represents for us here. Here, here at Genesis, we would say that we are doing everything that we can to model our lives after Jesus Christ. And that's why you'll sometimes hear me or you'll hear others talk about the importance of following Jesus. See, we believe a life committed to following Jesus is the heart of true Christianity. And our desire to follow Jesus comes in response to something that we sometimes call the gospel message. The word gospel just simply means the good news. It's the good news of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished with his life and what he accomplished with his death and with his resurrection. And let me just illustrate for you for just a moment what we mean by that. Using a tool that we've explained or taught around here, it's a tool that is sometimes referred to as the three circles. And it goes like this. I think that most every single one of us would agree that we live in a broken world. Uh, that it doesn't matter what you believe about God. That uh, when you think about our world today and all of the different examples of pain, when you think of the examples of war, uh, conflict, lack of trust, division, uh, disease... Um, again, it doesn't matter what you believe about God. I, I think for most of us, there's this sense that the world isn't working the way that it should. And that's not what God had in mind either. Because we believe that God created a, a perfect world. And he created this world to be a place of love. He created this world to be a place of peace uh, and of joy, a place where people would live in, in harmony and in closeness and relationship uh, with himself, but also that we would live, we would have that same closeness with one another. But we sinned. And we turned our back on God's. Uh, to sin means to go in your own direction. It's to choose your own selfish, that we insisted on our own selfish way. And the result of our sin is this brokenness and this death that so many of us experience uh, in this world and what we're experiencing right now. And at some point, we realize, I think every one of us, we realize that we're living in a broken world. And so what we do is we begin searching for an escape from this brokenness, wanting to experience that love and that joy and that peace that God intended for us. And so what we do is we'll, we'll turn to many different things in this world. We'll turn to things like money. Uh, we'll turn to things like relationships. Uh, we'll go looking to uh, what we can achieve and some of the goals that we put before ourselves. I, I think our busyness at times is a way of, of filling the void, of filling the needs. Even something like drugs or alcohol and addiction to substances, substances like these, uh, we, we turn to these things to help uh, fill that void uh, to find that significance that we can't seem to discover but what we find is that nothing in this world will truly satisfy. And that's bad news. But the good news is this, that the God of heaven loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world. And Jesus lived a sinless life. 
Uh, he lived life the way that it was intended to be lived. He lived a perfect, uh, obedient life, and he lived and he demonstrated that obedient life all the way to the cross where he took on our sin, uh, where he took the punishment for each and every one of us, and he gave his life, and he died, and then three days later, he rose from the gra- grave, he conquered sin, and he conquered death for us, and that is good news. And the Bible says this, the Bible says that if we will turn away from this brokenness, and if we will turn away from, from this death and trust God, that we will experience that same forgiveness, that we can experience forgiveness and new life for ourselves. And by doing so, what Jesus proclaims for us is that we are a new creation, uh, that we are new people, and now we are invited as followers of Jesus to follow Jesus and to live out God's plan and design for each of us. And for those of you that are new to this conversation about Jesus or maybe coming back to this message about Jesus for the first time in a long time, I hope that paints a a simple and yet powerful picture for you of Jesus and of Christianity. And I want to say this. Here's what it boils down to. Here's what makes Christianity so unique and so different from every other religion. You know, every other religion is about what you do. Christianity is about what has been done. It's about what's been accomplished for us in Jesus, that we discover that Jesus is all that we need, that he is our hope, again, that he is everything that we need. Here's what Jesus said about his life. It's recorded for us in the book of John in our Bibles. Jesus said this about himself. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Notice that Jesus is not one of many ways, but Jesus himself proclaimed that he is the way. Notice that that Jesus claimed to be the exclusive way to forgiveness, to eternal life, to peace with God both now and forever. And I know that even with words like that, that some of you might already be thinking, ah, yes, there's the catch. See, Christianity is too narrow. It's too exclusive. And on the one hand, You could say that that is true. But on the other hand, there isn't a more radically inclusive invitation than the invitation of Jesus Christ. Because with Jesus, the way to forgiveness and eternal life is wide open. It's a wide open door for all people. And it's not based on what you have done in your life. It's not based on what you've achieved. It's not about cleaning up your life or cleaning up your reputation first. No, the good news of of Christianity is that you can come to Jesus exactly as you are, that anyone can. Again, that it's not about what we've done, but it's about what Jesus has done on our behalf. It's all about what he accomplished for us on the cross and with his resurrection. And when you put your faith and when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you can begin to experience this new and redeemed life with God right now. And that means that it's not just something for the future, as important as that is, but eternal life is something that's meant to be lived right now and wherever you are. And we live it in a close, personal relationship with God. I don't know what your story is. Here, here's mine. I, I had the privilege of growing up in a home with wonderful parents, and uh, we, we were committed to a church. We went to church every single Sunday. But, man, I got to tell you, going to church uh, doesn't fix things. Going to church uh, isn't going to make you right with God. And here's what I mean by that. I mean, for every single one of us, there, there has to come a moment in your life where you make a personal choice to turn from your sin and to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And for me, that was when I was 12 years old. Uh, When I was 12, I made the personal decision that I wanted to trust Jesus with my life, with my forgiveness, and with my salvation. And I know that on that day that he forgave me of my sins, that I have new life, that I have eternal life with God, that he has a plan for my life in this world. And that because of that, I've got nothing to fear. And I was baptized as a way of demonstrating that life choice. Uh, My question for you right now is, do you have a story of your own? Do you have a moment that you can point to when you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Friends, it is the most important decision 
that you can ever make. And it's not a decision that you can make after you die. It's a decision that you must make before you die or before Christ returns. Uh, The Apostle Paul said this about that kind of decision of turning and trusting Jesus. He said, hey, here's what this looks like. It's recorded in Romans chapter 9 where Paul writes, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I want to ask you today, have you ever made a decision like that? And if not, why not? And why not right now? Why not right now even to take a moment, wherever you are, wherever you're seated, wherever you're watching, tuning in from right now, to just say, if you've never done this before, Jesus Christ, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Jesus Christ, I'm inviting you in today, realizing that it's not about who I am or what I've done. It's not about cleaning up your act first or your reputation, trying to go back and fix things that you can't fix, but just simply to turn to him, to turn to him humbly right now, and say, Jesus Christ, forgive me. I want you to be the Lord of my life today. I am trusting you with my eternity right now. I want to give you a moment to do that wherever you are. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you even right now as some of you are contemplating a decision like that, maybe even hesitating today, that you won't hesitate any longer, that you will turn to God and experience his forgiveness today. Father in heaven, I pray uh, for my friends. I pray for all of those who are tuning in and watching right now, especially for those who have never made a decision to trust Jesus, to trust you with their salvation. Uh, Father, we are trusting you for all things. We know that it's you that does that work in us, that work of forgiveness and redemption. Do your work right now, Lord. Draw people to yourself. Invite people into your family today so they can experience this new life and this forgiveness both now and forever and for always. And again, I, I wanted to say to you that if that's a decision that you are making right now, uh, man, we would love for you to let us know. I mean, if you're watching online, there's an opportunity for you to note that you're making that decision. Um, if you feel comfortable, we'll celebrate with you. Uh, you can comment uh, on, on social media right now that you're doing that. Uh, in just a few minutes, we'll have some pastors available in virtual prayer rooms. Man, we'd love to talk with you. We'd love to help you in thinking about next steps. Or maybe you've just got some questions. You've got some hesitations. Man, come meet one of our pastors, and uh, let's talk more about what's going on in your life right now. Again, there's no greater decision that you can make, and we'd love to help you in thinking about those next steps. But I want to say one more thing before we close and before our band uh, leads us in one last song. And this is true of anyone who would say that, you know, I'm a Christian. It would certainly be true of anyone who would say I'm a part of the Genesis family. But it's one thing to surrender your life to the Lord and to Jesus and to know the hope of eternal life. But let's also remember that we have a job to do. Uh, Going back to this three-circle illustration one more time, let's be reminded that as a new creation, as followers of Jesus, that we have been called by Jesus, our Savior, to go back into and to live in and to exist and operate in this broken world for the sake of helping others know Christ for the sake of, uh, of helping others to find their way back to God. And that, that's true of you if you're a kid. That's true of you if you're a middle school student, a high school student, or a college student. It's true of you if you're, you're single or married. It's true of you if you're, if you're working or if you're retired right now. Our world desperately needs to experience and to know the hope of Christ. I mean, too many people are overwhelmed by fear. They're overwhelmed by lack of trust and questions. And so Genesis, like our love, Our words, our faith, our generosity is more important now than ever before. And I would also say our willingness to demonstrate courage. That our world needs courage. And and, and I want you to be wise. And I am not suggesting in any way that you live reckless. But as our state continues to open and we begin encountering people all day long who are living in fear, Let's be followers of Jesus who are ready and willing to extend both compassion but also model and demonstrate courage for others as well because you and I, we have nothing to fear when our hope and when our life 
is in Jesus Christ. I love this verse from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter was a disciple of Jesus, and he says this. He says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And that's true for each of us, whether it be in your home right now, at school, at the park, on your next Zoom call, at the grocery store, and on social media too. And I'll leave you with this. Let's commit ourselves to this. Give people a reason this week, even today, to ask you about your hope. Can you and I, can we commit ourselves to giving people a reason to ask us about the hope that we have? Father in heaven, we thank you for the hope and for the life that we have through Jesus Christ. And we thank you for what you're doing in our church. We thank you for what you're doing even through this service right now and certainly in our community, in our world, Lord. Give us great faith. Give us great compassion and great hope and courage for the sake of others knowing Jesus Christ. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.